Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. It says, The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. And at that moment, everybody say that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Verse 8, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. Can you imagine what it's like to hear God walking about where you're at? So they hid from the Lord God in the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man. He called to Adam. He called to his wife. A very simple question. He said, where are you? Tonight, with your attention, for the next few moments, I'd like to preach. He's looking for you. If it's appropriate, would you reach over? Would you join hands with your neighbor? Lay a hand on your neighbor's shoulder and begin to pray in this place. Ask God to have his way in this heart, in, in our hearts, and in this house today. Uh, let's pray together. In Jesus' name, God, uh, I ask you to move. Uh, I ask your spirit to flow, God. Have free reign. Uh, have free course in this place, God. Let your spirit accomplish exactly what it wants to accomplish, Lord. Let your anointing fall in this house. I believe, Lord, uh, that you want to deliver. You want to set free. You want to break bonds of sin and addiction in this place. Uh, And in the name of Jesus, I come against anything that would try to stop or hinder the flow of the Holy Ghost, any human spirit, uh, any demonic spirit that would try to stop it. Uh, In Jesus' name, I loose angels of the Lord uh, to walk into this place in the name of Jesus. Uh, Let's clap our hands to the Lord together. Uh, Why don't you shout hallelujah? Come on, why don't we do that a couple more times? Uh, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, shout it a couple of times until you feel something start to flow. Uh, Hallelujah! I worship you, Jesus. Uh, I worship you, Lord. Uh, I worship you, Lord. Uh, Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the verses that we have just read, we read of Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman on this earth are suddenly deciding to rebel against their creator. They have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes are suddenly opened to what they have done. And for the very first time in human history, shame and guilt, the eternal companion of sin, floods into their human psyche. Now, all of us have sinned, as the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. So we understand what it's like to feel shame. We understand what it's like to feel guilt. We understand uh, that we comprehend that human feeling. Uh, But here's Adam and Eve for the very first time in their life. Uh, They've been walking with God in innocence. And all of the sudden, now uh, comes this feeling they cannot describe, uh, this feeling they cannot explain, uh, and they realize very quickly they don't like it it's uncomfortable it feels weird uh, and they look at each other and realize they are naked and so in desperation they sew some fig leaves together trying to cover up their sin trying to cover up their nakedness and then in their guilt in their shame in their embarrassment at what has just changed in their life they hear him He has come in the cool of the evening in what was presumably his pattern. And his voice begins to call out, Adam, Eve, where are you? And for the first time in human existence, in the presence of God, mankind felt panic instead of peace. They felt fear instead of love. 
And not knowing what to do, Adam and Eve hide themselves among the trees, uh, desperately trying to stay away from the eyes of an all-seeing and all-knowing God. Of course, you cannot hide from an all-seeing and all-knowing God. And so God begins to find them, and Adam eventually steps out and says, God, uh, I'm right here. And judgment is past. And mankind is now cursed, uh, or cursed rather, by sin, to toil and sweat, to labor to plant crops. The entry to Eden is blocked. It is a paradise forever lost. But in the same conversation, God brings a glimmer, a glimpse of hope. Because in the same conversation, he begins to speak of a day uh, when the seed of woman uh, would one day crush the head uh, of the serpent. When the seed of the woman would rise up uh, and that serpent that had beguiled and tricked them and led them into sin uh, would be crushed. And so unfolds the greatest story that has ever been told. A merciful God with an unexplainable love for his creation, begins to pursue the hearts of men. God went looking for a righteous man, and he found Noah. God went looking for a man to make a covenant with, and he found Abraham, the father of the faithful. God looked for somebody who desired his promise and his blessing above everything else in his life. And he found a Jacob uh, willing to wrestle and to contend uh, for the promises of God. God looked for a leader for his people and he found Moses who was willing to turn his back on the pleasures of the palace for a life of pain. God looked for a king and he found David worshiping him in the fields. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see a picture drawn uh, of a God that was constantly looking. Uh, He was looking for somebody. Uh, He was looking for a people. Uh, He was looking for somebody that was troubled by the sin in their life uh, and was desperate for a change and desperate to to put aside everything else and to begin to call out for God. Uh, He was looking uh, all throughout the Old Testament uh, and time and time again. uh, He called to the children of Israel, uh, and they would come to him, uh, and then they would turn aside. uh, He would call them, uh, and they would leave their idolatry and turn towards the one true God, uh, only to mess up and to fall and to fail time uh, and time again. So God, God kept looking. He kept looking, and this time he found himself a little young lady named Mary. He was looking for somebody willing to bear the promise. He was looking for somebody willing to carry uh, a blessing uh, and a burden. And the word uh, became flesh and began to dwell among us. Uh, God robed himself in flesh uh, and walked on this earth alongside uh, of his creation. We do not serve a God uh, who's so distant that we can't reach him. He's so far out there uh, that we can't know him. We serve a God uh, who got himself a body, uh, walked on this earth among you and I, uh, felt everything that we feel, experienced everything that we experience, uh, and overcame it. For us, he did not come to the palace. He did not come to the religious elite. He didn't come just for the wealthy or the powerful. He came for the hungry. As he said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And as you read through the Gospels, You read through the New Testament, you find that picture of a God that is looking, being continued. Luke chapter 15 and verse 1 says this, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. He was so different than the religious elite of the day. He was so open 
He was so inviting. He was so comfortable that even tax collectors uh, and other despicable sinners found themselves in a place uh, at his feet. There was something about Jesus uh, that led people to him. There was something warm uh, and inviting about him. And, of course, this made, verse 2, the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Be careful when it bothers you that somebody's in the house of the Lord. Be careful before you ever begin to say, yeah, but you don't know what they did yesterday. Uh, You don't know where they came from. You don't know what they've gone through in their life. Why are you hanging out with this person? So Jesus, hearing what the Pharisees have to say, begins to tell three parables in Luke chapter 15. Verse 4. He says, if a man had a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, Jesus said, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner that repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are religious and haven't strayed away. Uh, I'm telling you, we serve a God uh, who is willing to go looking for that lost sheep. He's willing uh, to go back out into the wilderness when everybody else is saying, hey, uh, we've got the 99. We're good enough. Uh, There's something in the heart of our God uh, that sees uh, and hears the voice uh, of that one lost sheep out in uh, the wilderness. But Jesus goes on. Now he's not talking about the wilderness. Now he's not talking about a lost sheep. In verse 8 he says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and she loses one of them. We've moved from 1% to 10% now. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she'll call in her friends and her neighbors and say, uh, Rejoice with me because I have found uh, my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Aren't you thankful we serve a God uh, that when a coin is lost in the house, uh, it's not out in the wilderness, it's in the house, uh, somewhere sitting on a pew, uh, somewhere in the presence of God, uh, he can sense it, uh, he can feel it, uh, he knows uh, there's a lost coin, uh, he knows uh, that one of his children is lost. uh, I'm so thankful I serve a God uh, that's willing to tear the place apart uh, and rip up the couch, uh, flip over the chair, and look for that lost coin uh, in the house. And then he moves on to perhaps one of his most famous parables. We know it, of course, is the parable of the prodigal son. And we've moved from one in a hundred to one in ten, and now down to one in two. In reality, in this parable, it's really two of two, for both sons are equally lost. If you're familiar with the story, just stay with me for a moment as I begin to lay it out. It was a certain man that had two sons, the older son and the younger son, and they served their father on the farm. And one day, something rose up in the heart of the younger son, and he began to look past the field. He began to look past the father's house at everything that this world had to offer him. And so he went to his father and said, Dad, you know, working for you on the farm, it's good and all, but why don't you give me my inheritance now? And for whatever reason, the father decides to give in to his son. Of course, this would have been extremely offensive to the Jewish audience of the day. Imagine that, a son coming. Anybody in here have kids? Anybody in here hope to give them an inheritance? I I mean, I'm I'm hoping. 
I got a few years to try to scrape something together, get something worked up. Can you imagine if my daughter's only three, but if she came to me and said, Dad, I want my inheritance now, I'd be like, get up off of me, man. Go play with your Play-Doh and hush your mouth. You can't get in your inheritance. The father has to die to get the inheritance. But here's this son, and he's looking at every other opportunity. He says, Dad, give me my inheritance now. And so the father gives him that inheritance. And it doesn't take long before this young man is no longer content uh, to work the fields and to to pull the weeds and to bring the crops in. But the young man decides one morning, uh, that's it, adios, dad, I'm out of here. I've got my sack of money, I'm going to a far land. Uh, And the Bible says he begins to waste his money in riotous living. Uh, He begins to get into the party scene. He begins to get into the crazy scene. Uh, He's spending his money on drugs and alcohol and parties and good times. uh, He's surrounded by friends. But then one day, like always happens, the money runs out. One day, like always happens, there's no more pleasure in sin. You see, the Bible makes no attempt to hide the fact that there is pleasure in sin for a season. But we here in Watertown, South Dakota, are completely familiar with the changing of seasons. Last Sunday, it was 60 degrees, and then on Wednesday, we start getting 25 inches of snow. Somebody explain that to me, Uh, but there is a changing of seasons. Uh, You see, my friend, you might be feeling content uh, and smug uh, and settled in in your sin right now, uh, but hear me carefully. Uh, There comes a day when that season will change. Uh, There comes a day when that alcohol you're enjoying, uh, when that marijuana you're enjoying, uh, when that little bit of pornography you're enjoying, enjoying. There comes a day uh, when all of a sudden it switches from pleasure uh, and it becomes your master and it begins to lead you. It begins to control you. uh, It begins to drive you. And so now the young man has no money. And as many in here are probably familiar when you ain't got no money and you ain't got no booze, you suddenly ain't got no friends. And so his friends desert him. Everybody abandons him. And the Bible says at the same time, a mighty famine hits the land. Uh, And so there's shortage everywhere. There's nobody with money. There's nobody with food. Uh, And this young man is now in a foreign land. uh, And he has nothing left to him. And he begins to look desperately for a job. Uh, He looks desperately for some handouts. uh, But all he can find uh, is the most disgusting, menial job possible in the world at that time. Uh, He finds himself a job feeding pigs uh, for a farmer. Again, to the context or in the context of this story, uh, to a Jewish audience, most of them would have rather begged uh, than feed pigs for a living. Most of them would have rather starved uh, than to ritually impurify or contaminate themselves by feeding pigs. Uh, But here's this young man, and his heart is so hungry. He's so lost. He's feeding pigs. And the Bible says he got so bad, he got so hungry that he began to look at the slop that he was feeding the pigs and say, man, I'd like to eat that. Troy is fond of saying that appetite is the greatest seasoning. And I'm telling you, it would take a lot of appetite for me to be angry and about what a pig was eating. It would take a lot of hunger in my life for me to be excited uh, about getting down in that trough next to the pig and beginning to fill my my belly. Anybody in here like to go to the farm and uh, hop down next to the pigs and begin to eat? Most of us would never even consider it. You'd have to pay us or we'd have to be starving to death. And so finally, verse 17 of Luke 15 says this. When he finally came to his senses. You see, I believe we all have that point where finally something sinks in. Finally something grabs a hold of us. Finally we look to our left and our right and realize, what am I doing? Why am I living this way? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You reach a point uh, in your life where you have hit rock bottom uh, and you're standing there and you're looking around and you're saying, what is going on? 
And so finally he comes to his senses. He realizes at home even the servants had food. uh, And here I am dying of hunger. uh, And he begins to concoct a plan in his life. Uh, He says, I will go home to my father. Uh, I'll say, Father, I've sinned against both you and heaven. Uh, I'm not worthy of being called your son. Please uh, take me back as a hired servant. Uh, And so the Bible says he returned home to his father. And watch this, verse 20. uh, While he was still... uh, A long way off, uh, his father saw him coming. You see, the Father uh, has been looking for you for the longest time. Uh, The Father has been watching uh, and waiting, knowing someday uh, my boy's going to hit bottom. uh, Knowing someday uh, my daughter, uh, oh, she's going to hit bottom. uh, And I'm going to be watching. uh, I'm going to be waiting. I'm going to be ready for that day uh, when she comes home. uh, And so the boy uh, is walking back to his dad. But not only does dad see him coming, uh, the Bible says uh, that he runs to his son. Uh, He embraces him. He kisses him. He falls uh, on his neck. Uh, In this story, the father uh, is uh, our heavenly father. Picture that for just a second. Uh, That's the kind of God we serve. Uh, Hassan, he's not a God uh, up in heaven with lightning bolts waiting to smite you down the next time you make a mistake. Uh, He's a God uh, with a pair of binoculars looking down uh, a dusty road that somebody walked away from him on, uh, and he's saying, come home, uh, come home, uh, come home, come back to me, uh, come back to me, Taylor, come back to me, Troy, uh, I want you uh, at my house. And so the young man begins his prepared speech. He says, Father, I've sinned against both you and heaven. Repentance is always the right place to start, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But you'll notice the father cuts him off before he can even get it all out of his mouth. The father says to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house. Put it on him. Get him a ring and put it on his finger. Get some sandals for his feet and kill the calf uh, we have been fattening. For we must celebrate uh, with the feast. For this son of mine was dead uh, and now has returned to life. He is lost, uh, but now he is found. uh, And so the party began. I'm telling you today, uh, God wants to have a party in this church, uh, in the little old Jesus church in Watertown, South Dakota. I believe God uh, is standing by with a robe uh, and a ring. He's standing by with some sandals. Uh, They're standing by with the fatted calf because today uh, God's son is coming home. Uh, Today uh, God's child is going to walk down uh, to a little old altar and say, Father, uh, I've sinned against you. Uh, I'm not a Worthy to be called your son. Uh, See, I don't care who you are. Uh, if this is your first time here, your second time here, your hundredth time here, uh, you are not here by accident. And I can't explain it to you. I can't tell you why. I don't even understand it completely myself. Uh, But there is a Father in heaven uh, who loves you with an undying love. Uh, We do not deserve his love. uh, But the Bible says because he first loved us, we can love him. See, even in your mess ups, even in your mistakes, God has been pulling for you. You can come to him just like you are. But the beauty of it is we serve a father who's not content to leave you like you were. The prodigal son came just like he was, still covered in the pig slop and the manure. Evidently, he didn't even have shoes on his feet. But the father wasn't happy. See, that's the miracle of salvation. You can walk into this church today addicted uh, and bound by sin and sin stained all over your life. And you can walk out white as snow and sanctified. Uh, You can walk in bound uh, and afraid and you can walk out with no fear uh, and a life filled with faith. uh, Because the power of the gospel still works. Uh, Repentance and baptism in Jesus' name uh, for the remission of sins, it still works. uh, 
the Holy Ghost uh, is still being poured out today in the 21st century. uh, And someone, uh, God is looking around today uh, saying, I'm ready to fill somebody with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'm ready uh, to put my spirit inside of somebody's life. Uh, Let's lift our hands to the Lord in this place. Uh, Uh, Come on, church, why don't we pray for a moment? Uh, The Holy Ghost is here right now. Uh, The Holy Ghost is here right now. Uh, In the name of Jesus. uh, (coughs) Hallelujah. That's the incredible thing about the God that we serve. He's not content to leave you like you came in. Uh, He wants to begin to change you. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission or the washing away of your sins, I would not wait. Uh, I would not hesitate. Today uh, is the day. If you've never been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues, uh, I would not wait. Today uh, is the day of salvation. Today is the day uh, that God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. But church... As long as God has been looking for the sinner, he's also been looking for a people. He's been looking for a people that are not content just to be saved and sit on a church pew, but are there uh, to fulfill his mission and his purpose. He's been looking for a people that are not content uh, just to feel the blessing of God, uh, but will join him out looking for the one. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul has just written, or written, wrote, written. He has just written that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we begin to persuade men. He goes on in verse 13. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. I'm fully aware that I look a little bit crazy today. But if by preaching with excitement, And trying to persuade under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I can bring somebody back to him. Uh, It brings glory to God. If we're in our right minds, it is for your benefit. But either way, Christ's love controlled us. And since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. He didn't just fill you with his spirit so you can live for yourself, but rather instead he says they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought we knew Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. And as I read through that passage, that verse stuck out to me. It it leaped off the page. Uh, It says that we in the church have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. I'll be the first one to admit. Our human fleshly eyes can get things so wrong sometimes. We can look at somebody and think, oh man, boy, do they need the gospel. And we can look at somebody, and though we'd never admit it, we'd never say it, uh, we'd look at them and think, yeah, they got it all together. Everything's going good in their life. Man, you know what? I don't need to share with them. We're being a respecter of persons. We're judging people uh, by our own human mindset and our human point of view. Uh, But that just doesn't mean the low. It means the rich, uh, the successful, the people that seem that have it all together. Uh, Everybody needs the gospel. That means that anybody, verse 17, who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life is gone has begun. Aren't you thankful for the transforming power uh, of God uh, that when we step into the kingdom of God, uh, we don't have to stay in the old life, but we can have a new life. But all of this, verse 18, is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. He went looking 
for a people. And as he sought to seek and to save the lost while he walked on this earth, he founded the apostolic church. And he began that task of reconciling his people back to himself uh, or restoring that close relationship that once existed uh, in the garden before sin began to destroy. And now watch this. God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. You see, now we, the church, those that have been washed in his blood and filled with his spirit. Now we are tasked with carrying out his mission. Now you and I must be the ones that are joining the Father in looking. You and I must join with him to seek and to save the lost. Like the servant in Luke chapter 14 We are to run to the highways and to the byways. Uh, We are to compel them to come uh, because his house must be full. Let's all stand together. But church, do we operate with the same intensity? Is 90 and 9 good enough? Are we satisfied to have a nice crowd in church on Sunday while knowing that there's an entire city of people that are hurting and broken and desperate for something different? Is nine of ten in the house enough? Are we daily watching for our son, our daughter to come home? I submit to you, That if we are not careful, it is entirely too easy for us to lose intensity of the Father's mission and purpose. He came to seek and to save the lost. And if I can speak for myself, it's entirely too easy to get comfortable in my little house with my little life and my little family and my 90 and 9 And all of that soothes the pain of the one that's out there wandering around lost and looking. Why don't we all come to the front together? I I, I would that everybody would come in this place. Let's gather across the front here. The Holy Ghost is wanting to do a work in this house today. I believe God is going to move in the next few moments. I'm not going to make anybody uncomfortable. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird that you don't want to do. But let's all gather into this place together. You see, I believe God has been pulling on some heartstrings even today during this moment. The power of God has been tugging on some hearts. And there have been young men and young women old men and old women in this place, that God uh, has been calling for you. And God has been saying, come home. I'm here to tell you right now, if you have never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, to have your sins washed away, today is your day. The baptismal is full. We can get it boiling hot pretty quick. And we can get ready to baptize you. We've got gowns. We've got robes. You don't even have to wear your own clothes. You don't have to leave soaking wet. But you can leave with all of your sin washed off of your life. You can leave with every mistake, every failure, uh, every scarlet stain on the sin of your life can be washed away today uh, in one moment when you obey the gospel. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues, God wants to fill you today, here. Now, anybody believe that in this place? God wants to fill somebody with the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you feel like you're in the house and you're that one coin, and you might be lost and you might be feeling like, I just, I don't know where I'm at in God. I don't completely understand what's going on in my life. I want you to know God 
is willing to tear up everything in the world to find just one simple coin. And that's you today. And so I'm going to ask you to take a step of boldness today. If you are willing and you want to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost today, would you raise your hand? If you've never received the Holy Ghost, but you want Jesus to come live inside of your life, today is your day. You don't have to be afraid. Nothing crazy is going to happen to you. But today uh, can be the day that you're filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost for the very first time. Uh, that's awesome. We got one. If any others want to be a part of it, we got two. We got three. Uh, that's incredible. God uh, is going to fill you today. Today, God is going to fill your life uh, with his spirit, and you're going to leave never feeling the same way again. Uh, you're not going to battle uh, the same things in the same way that you did ever before, because now God uh, is going with you. Uh, if, you if you raise your hand, would you gather in the front here? Just make some space. Make, I, I told you it's a step of boldness, but it's all right. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name and you want to be baptized today, and you want to take that step, would you be willing to raise your hand in this place? All right. And finally, one more step of boldness. If you feel like you need God to come find you today, you're not entirely sure where everything's at, you're struggling, it is, it is not a problem. It is not wrong to admit you're struggling. All right? Can we, can we ignore, can we bust through, can we break through that stigma? There is no shame in admitting to a church body, hey, I'm, I'm struggling right now, I'm battling, I'm facing some things in my life. There's no shame in that at all. The shame that you feel is the shame that the devil's trying to put on you to keep you away from the presence of God. But if you're in this place today and you absolutely need God to do something special in your life to break you out so you can get back into his presence like you used to, would you slip a hand into the air today? We want to pray with you. We want to believe that God wants to do something incredible. All right. We got one. We got two. We got three. Again, would you gather near the front here? So here's what we're going to do. The Holy Ghost is here right now. We're going to take our time. We're going to make sure that we understand what's going on. But I believe God is about to move in this place. As a church together, we're going to pray a prayer of repentance. Repentance is simply saying, God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for all my mess-ups, my mistakes, my failures. And God, uh, I'm not going to live that way anymore, but I'm going to turn my life to you. It's, it is to confess with your mouth. It's important that you open your mouth and begin to talk to him and say, God, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, and then it is to turn away or to forsake your sin and to purpose in your heart that I am going to live differently. That is the essence. That is the point of repentance. And after we come through that time of repentance, I'm going to begin to pray a prayer of faith. And as I pray that prayer of faith, when I finish within the name of Jesus, I want us as a church together to yell the name of Jesus as absolutely loud as we can.